Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth, presented by Associates for Biblical Research. I'm your host, Henry Smith. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about the Moabite king, Misha. And we're pleased to welcome back ABR staff researcher and writer, Brian Windle, to do another archaeological biography. Brian, welcome back to Digging for Truth. Good to have you on the show once more, my dear friend. Well, thanks, Henry. I just can't say no when you invite me back. I love to talk about archaeology and history. Well, you, you better you better get ready because this is going to keep happening. All righty. Sounds good. <laughs> All right. So today we're talking about uh, King Misha. Okay. And um, uh, very interesting archaeological biography they're going to be walking through today. Let's start by talking about uh, you know, he's a Moabite. So uh, a little background there on the Moabites first, and then uh, we'll work our way into it. Sounds good. Okay, so the Moabites are um, trace their lineage back to that incestuous relationship between Lot and one of his daughters that's recorded in Genesis chapter 19. And their, their territory traditionally was to the east of the Dead Sea, between the Arnon River to the north and the Zered uh, Brook to the south. And through the centuries, this region was hotly contested. It kept flipping hands back and forth uh, through history. Uh, Dr. Bryant Wood has a, has a good summary. He writes, at the time of the conquest, at the end of the 15th century, the region was occupied by the Amorites, who had earlier taken it from the Moabites. The Israelites then captured the area with the tribe of Reuben taking possession. And then the area seesawed back and forth for several centuries, passing to the Moabites, the Israelites, the Ammonites, back to the Moabites, who were then subject to Israel. And so um, so that's a little bit of where the Moabites came from and their territory. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, military and political ping pong taking place there over the course of time that Dr. Wood describes. Okay, so that kind of gives us the background of the Moabites themselves, just a general sketch. Okay, we're obviously going to be zeroing in on King Misha. So uh, let's, uh, let's focus there in the uh, mid-9th century BC, Brian. Yes, yeah, so in the mid-19th century BC, Misha, or Mesha, we'll say Misha for now, um, he was became the ruler of Moab, and then Moab became a, a vassal um, to Israel. Actually, that had happened in the days of Misha's father. And uh, so after he came to power, he led a rebellion against um, Israel, threw off the shackles of Israelite um, uh, vassalship, refused to pay tribute, and established a Moabite independence again. Now, everything we know about Misha comes really from two sources. It comes from uh, the Bible, uh, 2 Kings chapter 3, and it also comes from uh, a very famous artifact called the Misha inscription or the Moabite stone. And so in 1 Kings chapter 3, we read, Now Misha, the king of Moab, was a sheep breeder and had to deliver to the king of Israel a hundred thousand lambs and the wool of a hundred thousand rams. But when Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. Now, the biblical text identifies Misha as a sheep breeder. And, and our viewers, we don't want you to think of a, of a lowly shepherd. That's not what's being communicated here. Misha was a man who was no doubt powerful. He had been made wealthy through the trade of uh, large flocks of sheep. In fact, the area of Moab included lush fields that were that were ideal for raising sheep. In his own inscription, Misha identifies himself as a man of Debon, uh, who had inherited the throne of Moab after his father had reigned for 30 years. And at some point during his father's reign, the Omri dynasty, so the kings of Omri, um, of Israel and Omri and his sons, they had um, expanded and annexed Moab and imposed this heavy tribute on, on Misha uh, or on Misha's father. And, and of course, that's the situation that Misha inherited. So what the Bible records when Ahab died, Misha rebelled against King Jehoram his son, who had ascended the throne. And so we read, King Jehoram marched out of Samaria at that time and mustered all Israel, and he went and sent word to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me to battle against Moab? And so um, the Judahites join Israel. We're also told that the king of Edom joined the coalition too, and they all attacked Moab. And so according to 2 Kings, this coalition had some initial success. Eventually, 
um, caught Misha, had him in his southern capital of Kir Hiraseth, and uh, but Israel wasn't able to take the city. And then there's this kind of weird, interesting uh, part of the story where we read, when the king of Moab saw the battle was going against him, he took with him 700 swordsmen to break through opposite the king of Edom, but they could not. Then he took his oldest son, who was to reign in his place, and offered him for a burnt offering on the wall. And there came a great wrath against Israel, and they withdrew from him and returned to their own land. And so Moab was able to throw off the yoke of Israel, bringing uh, the area once again under the authority of Moab. Yeah, all those descriptions there are very typical of uh, territorial and military wrangling in the ancient Near East, to be sure. But this uh, particular incident here, Brian, you wanted to focus a little bit on this about about who uh, the controversy over the sacrifice here that took place. Uh, it might even sound a little strange to modern ears. Uh, tell us about some of that. Sure. Well, the traditional interpretation has been that the king of Moab took his own son and sacrificed him on the wall. And this so offended the Israelites that they called off the attack and retreated. And, and I have always found that unconvincing in light of a couple of things. First of all, Israel had already slaughtered a number of Moabites in the battle to this point. And second of all, Israel was not following God at this time. I mean, these are the kings of Israel, and we're told Omri, Ahab, Ahaziah, and Joram all did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So I find it hard to see them taking offense at the attack. On the other hand, the verse just before this refers to both the king of Edom and the king of Moab. So it could be either whose son was chosen. And I think it's a better interpretation to say that the king of Edom's son was the one sacrificed. I think it's as plausible in their book, The Sacred Bridge, Anson Rainey and Steve Notley explain how this might have happened. They say, when Misha tried to break through to escape the siege and probably go north to Dabon, he chose the part of the enemy ranks where the Edomites were stationed, probably thinking they would be easier prey. But he misjudged his foe. The Edomites did not crack. However, Misha did manage to take an important prisoner, the son and heir of the Edomite king, who was already the co-regent. Misha then took him up on the wall and made him a human sacrifice. The Edomites had come in support of Judah and Israel, and the loss of their crown prince was a fatal blow to the Edomite morale. Their anger against the Israelite army was such that their own withdrawal from the campaign left the Judean and Israelite troops exposed and far from their home bases. They had no choice but to withdraw in ignominy. In fact, the sacrifice of the Edomite co-regent was denounced generations later by Amos in Amos 2, verse 1. So I think that's a better scenario and a better way to interpret that passage. Yeah, you know, I hadn't really thought about much about this. And so you kind of go to the default mode. Oh, that was offensive, right? You know, like you said, but the context, you dig, just dig a little bit. And this is a great lesson for any Bible study. You know, dig a little deeper to find out. Don't go with those initial inclinations because sometimes they don't bear out by the text. This is a great job, Brian. Well, in our next segment, we're going to talk about the Moabite stone or the Misha Stila, which is a phenomenal discovery. So folks, stay tuned and we'll be right back after this message. ABR is excited to announce the publication of Volume 2 from our excavations at Kerbid el Makater. The volume details archaeological remains from about 350 BC to the 8th century. This includes a New Testament village that may have been visited by Jesus. Over 400 pages of analysis, photos, and maps. You can pick up a copy today by visiting BibleArchaeology.org. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm Henry Smith. We're here today talking about King Misha of Moab with Brian Wendell. Okay, Brian. We want to talk about one of our favorite discoveries, uh, otherwise known as the Misha Stila or the Moabite Stone. Yeah, this is arguably the most important um, Iron Age inscription on either side of uh, the Jordan River, the Dead Sea. Um, it is uh, an inscription that was left by Misha, the king of Moab. It was, it's a, it's a black basalt monument, likely set up near the end of Misha's reign, commemorating all of the things that he had done during his reign. It was discovered in Dabon, Jordan in 1868 by an Anglican missionary named Frederick Klein. Now, it wasn't discovered in an, in an excavation. He discovered that this Bedouin tribe had it. And, um, and so, um, 
the, the Bedouin tribe actually broke it into pieces when the Ottoman Empire started pressuring them to try and hand it over. And, um, and but thankfully, a, a paper mache squeeze was made of the inscription before the stone was broken into pieces. And eventually, Charles Simon Clement Gano, a French archaeologist, was able to obtain most of the fragments and, and assemble it and, and reassemble it based on and, and include the squeeze. And that is currently in the Louvre Museum in France. And so the Mobite stone contains about 34 lines of of this of this inscription from Misha and it's all written in Moabite and the interesting thing is that it addresses the situation that we described in the last segment the rebellion of Misha against Israel in 2nd Second, 2nd Second Kings 3 but from the Moabite perspective yeah it's good you could almost take that story about how the stone got broken and all that stuff and make a you know, like almost a mini movie out of the whole the whole exactly. thing. But for our purposes here, here again, we have a, another situation during the divided kingdom where we've got incidents taking place uh, in antiquity in the biblical text, and then we have almost the you know the the opposite, uh, maybe opposite perspective from the from our from the opponents of Israel. It's just it's just remarkable. So t- tell us a little bit more about the relationship between the description and uh, in the in the stone versus what we see in the text. Talk, let's talk a little more about that. Yeah, so the Moabite stone begins with these words. I am Misha, son of Chemosh, king of Moab the Demonite. My father ruled over Moab for 30 years, and I ruled after my father. I made this high place for Chemosh, that's the Moabite god, and Karaho, high place of salvation, for he saved me from all the kings and made me enjoy the sight of my enemies. Omri, king of Israel, oppressed Moab for a long time because Chemosh was angry with his country. His son succeeded him, and he also declared, I will oppress Moab. In my days, he declared thus, but I enjoyed his view and that of his house. Israel was destroyed forever. Of course, we know that Israel was not destroyed forever at that point. Omri had taken possession of the land of Madaba, and he dwelt in it during his days, and during half of my days, his sons, 40 years, but Chemosh restored it during my days. And so the Moabite stone affirms that Moab was subject to Israel, but that Misha had rebelled against that. And a simple calculation of the 40 years that uh, Misha references, uh, brings the re- his rebellion into the days of King Joram, king of Israel, which is just as it's stated in the biblical account. It affirms that the primary god of Moab was Chemosh. And, and interestingly, if you keep reading uh, the inscription of the Moabite stone, it contains one of the earliest references to Yahweh, uh, the one true god of the, the Israelites. Among the spoils Misha claims to have taken were these things called the altar hearths of Yahweh. We're not sure exactly what those were, but interesting that that mentions uh, Yahweh. I also should maybe note this one interesting thing. Uh, there's this constant reference to Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Chemosh was their supreme god. Uh, he's named six times in the Bible, 12 times in this particular stone. And what's really interesting is that um, we don't really know a lot about uh, Chemosh. There may be an image of him on the Al Balu Moabite Stella displayed at the Jordan Museum, where it looks like maybe a, a god is crowning one of the Moabite kings. That might be Chemosh. But I bring this up because some critics today dismiss the historicity of the Bible solely on the grounds that it's a religious text. And yet at the same time, they'll take a historical um, writing like the Moabite stone or the annals of the kings of Assyria or the Babylonian uh, Babylonian inscriptions, and, and they'll say, oh, we'll take those as history. And yet what we see is that all of the foreign um, inscriptions from other people reference their own gods and attribute their victories to their own gods. It's this false dichotomy that is set up that it can be religious or it can be historical, but it can't be both. And then there's this double standard that happens when we accept the Moabite stone as actual history, but we question the biblical history because it is a religious text. And so I think um, the fact that something is religious doesn't affect the historicity 
of the events described therein. Yeah, that's that's a great apologetic point. I think we should, as the church, not fall into that trap of accepting the premise of that argument. Uh, and you laid it out very well. Okay, so so tell us more about the Moabite stone because it not only tells us about this rebellion and and King Misha, but we and you already alluded to the Yahweh reference. But uh, what else? What else do we have uh, reference to a more famous king of Israel, perhaps? <laughs> Exactly. Well, one of the beautiful beautiful things about the Moabite stone is that it provides a lot of historical background. It fills in the picture of what's happening at that particular point in history. And so as soon as Misha had thrown off the shackles of Israelite oppression, he claims that he set about um, consolidating his kingdom by attacking the cities in the region that were still held by Israel. So for example, um, in one line it says, Chemesh said to me, go take Nebo from Israel. I went in the night and I fought there from dawn until noon. I killed everyone, took 7,000. Um, another one says the king of Israel had built Yahaz. He lived there while fighting against me, but Chemesh drove him out before me. But the most famous one, the one that you alluded to, Henry, is, is this line that says, the house of David dwelt in Horonain. And Shemash said to me, go down and fight against Horonain. And I went down and fought against the city and took it. Shemash restored to it in my days. Now, 30 years ago, Alan Millard suggested this might say the house of David. But the problem with it is that um, the phrase cuts across uh, a part that's still there in the original stone and part that's missing but is there in the paper mache squeeze. And so it's been a little difficult to read. But most recently, there have been a number of studies that I think have finally solidified the fact that it does indeed say House of David. In 2015, there was a group of researchers that used reflectance transformation imaging, which combined multiple high resolution photographs from different angles and different lighting into a single image. And then uh, in 2018, a team from the Louvre took new photos by shining a light through the paper mache squeeze. And when you compare the results of both of these things, it's pretty clear that that phrase does say House of David. So now we have a second inscription from antiquity that mentions David. That's fantastic, Brian. Uh, you know, it's, it's the blessing and curse of technology. Many things bad with technology, but in this case, aids us into better understanding artifacts that have been discovered sometimes decades or even over a century ago. Well, we're going to enter our last segment shortly here, Brian. We'll be right back after this break. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. We're talking about King Misha of Moab with Brian Wendell. Okay, Brian, uh, let's talk more about the uh, other archaeological evidence related to the Moabites and King Misha. Uh, we still got more to talk about. Yes, we do. There are, there are at least three more um, archaeological findings that I think relate to Misha and this period in Moabite history. Uh, the first is uh, Kir Hereseth. This is the location of the siege where Misha sacrificed the king of Edom's son, the, the co-regent on the walls. It's identified as modern Carrick, and not a lot remains at modern Carrick uh, from the time of the Moabites. It's actually more famous for a crusader castle that's there. But there was one artifact that was discovered when a foundation trench was dug. It is a, an inscription that is, uh, is, is a black stone that has a royal Moabite inscription. It's been translated, just the first part is still there, Kemoshiat, king of Moab, the temple of Chemosh for an altar. That's all that's there. But it establishes um, its evidence of Moabite presence at Kerak or Kir Hereseth in the 19th, 9th century J BC, just as the Bible says. There's a second artifact, the altar that was discovered recently at a biblical Atarot. Um, on the Moabite stone, Misha says, the men of Gad dwelt in the land of Adarot from ancient times, and the king of Israel had built Adarot, but I fought against the city and took it. I killed the entire population. Adarot is identified as Kirbet uh, 
at a ruse, and in 2010, excavators there discovered a 50 centimeter tall altar base that, that also included a Moabite inscription that may reference Misha's rebellion. Uh, it says that 4,600 Hebrews and foreign men were scattered from the desolate city. And so if this is referring to Atarot and um, Misha taking it back, it's, a, it's another important, um, important piece of evidence, archaeological evidence, that relates to this particular point in history. And then the, the longest description part on the Moabite stone is Misha's description of building this place called uh, Karaho. We, we don't really know what that is, but he says, I built Karaho, the walls of its parks and the walls of its citadel. citadel. I built its gates, its tower and a royal palace. Um, he talks about making retaining walls there. Um, and because Misha claims to have erected this stone, this stilla that we've been talking about, the Moabite stone, at the high place for Chemish at Karaho, and since the, the stone, the Moabite stone, was discovered at Dabon, uh, many people believe that, that the citadel of Dabon was the Karaho that Misha is describing here. In fact, um, in his excavation report from the first season excavating at Debon, Fred Winnett says, it seems necessary to conclude that the Karaho and Debon were both located on the northwestern part of the mound. The earliest settlers would doubtless have occupied part of the mound where the sides are the steepest and most easily defensible, namely the north and northeast uh, western areas. Hence, it's probable this was Misha's royal suburb. In fact, he goes on to talk about a wall that they discovered there. And he says, in view of the fact that Misha, of Misha's explicit assertion that he provided the bone with towers and they discovered a wall with towers there, he says it seems, um, it seems pretty obvious that this may indeed be the wall that Misha claims to have built at Karaho. And you can see the remains of, a, of an Iron Age wall at Debon there today that may be the wall that Misha himself built. Yeah, so that, that gives us an, uh, even a broader sort of context of, of the archaeological background, some of it not directly related to the biblical text explicitly. But again, we've talked many times on the show, Brian, about how not only specifics, but general background too, just to help uh, help us in the modern day know our Bibles better. It's it's really remarkable how archaeology fills in the gap. Well, we got a couple minutes left, Brian. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, the viewer who might have just been tuning in today for the first time and hearing about this evidence, maybe excited about it, hopefully. Um, share with us uh, your final thoughts on the, the broader importance of uh, what we do here with archaeology and what we do here on Digging for Truth. Yeah, Henry, well, we've said numerous times on Digging for Truth that the benefit of archaeology to biblical studies is twofold. It, it first of all, affirms um, things that are mentioned in the Bible. And so in this case, we see that the Moabite stone affirms a number of details that are in the biblical text. It affirms uh, that Misha was the king of Moab, that Moab was under Israelite subjugation, and that and that uh, Misha rebelled against him and was successful in his rebellion. All of those things are, are affirming what we see in the biblical text in 2 Kings 3. But, but more broadly, and, and the thing that I love about archaeology is that it, it provides, it illuminates Scripture. It, it, it provides more detail than the basic things that we have. And in this case, because we have the same event that is described both from um, the Israelite or the Hebrew perspective in 2 Kings 3 and the Moabite perspective on the Moabite stones, they can inform each other. And so we get a better picture of what was happening uh, at this turbulent time um, in, in Israelite and Judahite and, and Edomite and Moabite history with this particular event. Oh, that's fantastic, Brian. Well, thanks again for uh, the research that you're doing, for working together in this this great endeavor of studying the Bible and sharing with people why they can trust it. Appreciate you, man, and uh, looking forward to having you on once more. Sounds good. Thanks, Henry. All right, friends, thank you for tuning in and watching Thinking for Truth. If you tuned in for the first time today, I hope that this program excited you and encouraged you in understanding that you can trust the Scriptures. Uh, we have an entire archive of over 230 shows available on our YouTube channel and also on the Lighthouse TV website for you to enjoy, explore, and to learn more about why you can trust the Bible. 
We appreciate your support uh, watching the show, and we're grateful for most of all for your prayers as we continue to fulfill the mission that God has given us. And we thank you for watching Digging for Truth. Digging for Truth is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV. Positively different.